Hello everyone and welcome to the February 2025 Sky Report. My name is Vanessa and I'm joined today by Patrick. Hi everyone. Let's see what's happening in the skies this month. After sunset on February 1st, we will see the crescent moon at just over 15% full on the western horizon, just after sunset next to the bright planet Venus. This will be very similar to the V that we had on December 4th in 2024, when this picture was taken. Last month, we watched the moon pass in front of the planet Mars. But this month, we will see the moon pass in front of the bright, prominent star cluster M45, also known as the Pleiades. Throughout the evening of February 5th, we will watch the moon slowly approach the cluster. This will be visible across the continental United States, but for us here in Southern California, the main event occurs as the moon is setting. Around midnight and into the early morning of February 6th, we will see the moon finally start to cover up the bright stars of the Pleiades. On this evening, the moon will be just over 50% full, just past the first quarter phase. This means that the stars of the Pleiades will seem to disappear behind the unilluminated side of the moon. It might be difficult to see with just your eyes because of the bright glare from the moon, but binoculars or a telescope will provide greater detail of the event if you have them. Throughout the month, the winter hexagon will still be high in the sky, but on the 9th, it will have two visitors. The waxing gibbous moon is in the constellation Gemini, close to the heads of the twins, marked by the stars Castor and Pollux, and nearby to Mars. On the evening of the 24th, Mercury and Saturn will appear low in the western sky, positioned directly below Venus. The two planets will be separated by a distance equivalent to three full moon diameters. However, spotting them may be challenging due to the brightness of twilight. Using a pair of binoculars is the best way to observe them. Four out of the five planets visible to the unaided eye will be visible in February. Notice that by 7 p.m. the planet Saturn will be low near the western horizon. This means that the first few days of February are your best and last chance to squeeze in a few last views of Saturn for the season. By sunset on the 15th scene here, the planet will be only 3 degrees above the horizon, which is not ideal for viewing. Start viewing the planets from west to east, watching Saturn and Venus first. Venus will slowly become a crescent throughout the month, going from about 37% full at the beginning of the month to 15% at the end. Jupiter will stay in the sky all month and will be a steady and interesting object to watch. In a telescope, you'll see Jupiter's four Galilean moons, and with just your eye, it will look like a very bright star in the constellation of Taurus. Mars is now past opposition and its closest approach, but it remains an interesting object to look at with a telescope. The first week of the month will provide the best views. As the Earth begins to move away throughout the month, Mars's apparent size will decrease from about 14 arc seconds to 10 arc seconds. If you're unfamiliar with the arc measurements, for comparison, Jupiter this month will be about 43 arc seconds across. So Mars will appear about a quarter of the size of Jupiter by the end of the month. Mars will be easily visible in the sky with just your eyes in the constellation of Gemini all month. You might notice its reddish color compared to the bluish star Castor in Gemini. Let's take a look at all the constellations that'll be out this month. High in the sky, the constellations we will continue to see all month are Taurus, Orion, Gemini, and Canis Major, showing off the brightest stars in the winter sky. Orion is one of the most recognizable constellations in our sky, with two very bright stars, Betelgeuse and Rigel, the latter appearing in the winter hexagon. We see Pisces towards the west starting to set. Looking east, the spring constellations rise into the late night sky. Leading the way is Leo the Lion, with its head and mane forming the shape that resembles a backwards question mark. Below Leo is Virgo the Maiden, where the waning gibbous moon is shown here. Looking northeast, you can use the handle of the Big Dipper to locate the bright stars near the eastern horizon. Simply follow the curve of the handle to find Arcturus in the constellation Bootes the Herdsman, and then continue the arc downwards to locate Spica in Virgo the Maiden. Remember the phrase, arc to Arcturus and speed down to Spica. Looking west, Orion and Taurus gradually descend towards the horizon, setting around 2.30 a.m. Jupiter sets a bit earlier, just before 2 a.m., followed by Sirius about 15 minutes later. 
Be sure to catch these winter jewels while you can, as they set earlier each night. Those are all the events that we have for February, but we have one last item to leave you with. Patrick, please tell us about your experience chasing twilight. Well, yes, indeed. I had a truly extraordinary experience uh, on a flight from Dublin to Los Angeles. I was seated by a window, and I had a perfect view to photograph the stars in the night sky during flight. The journey spanned 5,200 miles, taking over 11 hours across the North Atlantic Ocean, southern Greenland, and into North America. As the plane departed Dublin during sunset, flying westwards at over 500 miles per hour, I snapped this picture off the seatback screen, showing the plane's position near the Terminator, the line dividing night and day. With the plane's position along the Terminator. I looked out the window, and I was greeted by this spectacular view of sunset over the Atlantic Ocean, west of Ireland. At ground level, the sun would be approximately one degree below the horizon, and it would be dark on the ground. However, at cruising altitude of 34,000 feet, the sun was still visible, sitting three degrees above the horizon. This phenomenon occurs because at high altitudes, we can see farther over the Earth's curved surface, extending our line of sight to the sun. An hour later, the sun finally dipped below the horizon, marking the beginning of twilight. I expected the sky to grow dark and the stars begin to appear in less than an hour, as it does on the ground every night. But that's not what happened. Two hours after sunset, I looked outside, and to my astonishment, it was still twilight. As we approached southern Greenland, Venus could be seen shining just above the wing. Three hours after sunset, twilight was still there. Even four hours after sunset, the blue hour still lingered. By this time, I decided to take a nap. After I woke up, this was the view. Eight hours after sunset, twilight was still present as the plane flew over North Dakota. What was going on here? The answer lies in this series of maps taken off the in-flight entertainment screen. It turns out that all this time, the plane was keeping pace just behind the Terminator in the twilight zone. At high latitudes, the Terminator was moving westwards at 519 miles per hour, while the plane cruised in the same direction at 500 miles per hour, nearly matching the Terminator's speed. After eight hours in the twilight zone, the sky darkened enough to reveal Orion rising in the east. It was still technically twilight when this picture was taken, and then finally, the moment I waited for, nighttime. I am looking out the window at Orion from 39,000 feet, free from atmospheric haze, with Taurus and Jupiter just above it. With the thinner air, no light pollution, and minimal atmospheric interference, the night sky appeared almost identical to what astronauts would see from the International Space Station. To Orion's right side, I could clearly see the faint stars of Eridanus the River, the longest constellation in the sky extending to the south. This is hard to see without a clear dark sky from the ground. This photograph was taken with a four-second exposure, and it took several attempts to keep the camera steady against the plane window. Covering my head with a blanket to block the cabin lights, the night sky was spectacular. The stars were shining so brightly, almost like what you see from the Zeiss star projector at the Samuel Ocean Planetarium at Griffith Observatory. So, if you ever get a window seat on a night flight, take a moment to look out. You are so much closer to the stars, and it's a rare chance to experience the night sky in a whole new way. Vanessa, I know that you had a similar experience on a flight last year, didn't you? Yes, I actually did, Patrick. Planes make great observatories because they fly above so much atmosphere. This is Comet Suchinchen Atlas in October of last year on a flight from New York to Los Angeles. And here is your lunar calendar for the month. First quarter is on the fifth. Full moon is on the twelfth. The last quarter is on the twentieth, and the new moon is on the twenty-seventh. Well, that's all we have for February. If you want to watch the lunar occultation of Mars broadcast from January, the link is below in the description. Thank you so much for joining us this month, and we'll see you again next month. Bye. Bye.